Hey there, this is Tori. Welcome to River City. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Our service this morning will last just about an hour. We will spend some time singing together, then we will listen to an inspirational message from God's Word.
Hey there, this is Tori. Welcome to River City. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Our service this morning will last just about an hour. We will spend some time singing together, then we will listen to an inspirational message from God's Word. Here at River City, we believe in the power of prayer, and we want to partner with you. Simply text RCC Pray to 97000 and follow the instructions. River City Church, we want to thank you for your generosity. You can continue to give your tithes and offerings online. Every week, you can access your child's curriculum right here. Follow the links under the Kids City section for your child's video for the week. Have you downloaded the RCC app yet? Simply text RCC app to 77977 or search the App Store for RCC Lewiston and take River City with you wherever you go. Right now, if you could open the RCC app and go to the Connect section, there is a link to our connection card. It is the best way for us to connect with you, so please take some time to fill it out during the service. Would you like to discover your gifts and learn more about us here at River City? Please join us for Growth Track Online. Contact the church office for more information on how you can attend. We are having an Easter Jam FX, an Easter party big enough for the whole family. Kiddos and students, preschool through high school, bring the adults in their lives, parents, grandparents, guardians, to help share in an Easter celebration followed by a glow-in-the-dark Easter egg hunt. Wednesday, March 31st, 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the River City Auditorium. Invite a neighbor or two to join in on the fun. Easter is when we get to celebrate the biggest event in history, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. In a season when social distancing has been encouraged, let's not forget what matters most is a true connection with Jesus and with each other. We invite you to create that kind of connection by hosting a watch party for our Easter Sunday services. On April 4th, choose from 8.30 a.m. or 10 a.m. at rivercity.online.church. As you gather with your loved ones, reach out to neighbors or friends to join you in the celebration and share a meal. Life is better together. Are you ready to take the next step in your faith and be water baptized? We will be having a baptism class April 5th at 6.30 p.m. at River City. And then Baptism Sunday will be on April 11th following the second service. Sign up with the church office. If you have any questions about what's going on here at River City, please reach out to the church office at 208-743-7101, Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Thanks again for being here. We hope you have a fantastic day. You are.
and I'll chase your voice through the dark. Fix my eyes on the unexpected in the wonder of your shadow step. So take another step.
Hey, welcome everybody to River City Online. We are continuing the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 14 today, so if you have a Bible, turn there. It'll be on the screen so you can follow along with us. Let me ask you a question. If you had the cure for a disease and you were the only one that had the cure, and you knew that it would save not just one person, but 10,000 people, would you feel any sense of responsibility to maybe give away that cure? I would hope so. I would hope so. Of course you would. Of course you would. It's interesting because Tim Elmore says this, sociologists tell us that the most introverted of all people will influence 10,000 others in the average lifetime, in their average lifetime. The average introverted person will influence 10,000 people in their lifetime. As believers, as Christians, we carry the greatest cure for death. Jesus, he is the cure. He is the one who saves. He is the one who forgives. And, and I, to get excited about that mission is wonderful. But to actually do something beyond getting excited, to actually take it out there and give the good news. And Pastor Brad did a great job last week of sharing that Go mission. And we're going to continue in that theme because that is the theme of the book of Acts, is taking the great commission, making disciples, taking the good news of Jesus to the world. And we're in chapter 14. Chapter 13 of Acts was all about the first missionary journey. They, Paul and Barnabas are launched out from Antioch. And they begin their first missionary journey, and they head to, to Cyprus, and they begin uh, sharing the good news in the synagogue, and then to the Gentiles, and they continue on that journey. In a little bit, I'll show you a map of that. But at the end of chapter 13, verse 52, it says this, they'd been kicked out of the city, had a lot of fruit, a lot of people came to know Christ, but it says they were kicked out of the city because some unbelieving Jews rose up and pushed them. And look what it says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So they experienced rejection, but fruit, but also rejection. It says they're filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. It's awesome. These guys, let me just, let me just show you the map of where they, where they started and kind of how the journey begins. If you put that map up, you'll see that it goes from Antioch in Syria over to Cyprus, this island, uh, Salamis, and then pa Paphos, and then they start heading up into what would be now modern-day Turkey in Asia Minor there. <clears throat> and so they begin that trek. Now, this is quite a, this is quite a journey Obviously, via ship first, and then and then on foot, and with, with the with the herd of the herd of animals needed to carry things. But anyway, this is quite a journey. And these guys, let me tell you, these guys had serious grit. Let me let me give you a definition of godly grit. It's that no matter what for the mission of Jesus, no matter what for Jesus and his mission, no matter what godly grit, grit that perseverance, that endurance, that. If we get knocked down, we'll get back up. It's, it's an incredible tenacity. And that's what Paul and Barnabas have. And we're going to see in chapter 14 an incredible tenacity that should encourage us. And I believe we can learn some things from it. So I want to give you some of those things. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 14. Now it happened in Iconium that they were together. They went together to the synagogue of the Jews. And so spoke that a great multitude, both of Jews and of the Greeks, believed. So not only did they have fruit on that first, in chapter 13, we see that the fruit is continuing as they go to the next city in Iconium. And they present the gospel first for the Jews. Now, this was a common thing. They'd go to the synagogue first, preach the, the gospel to the Jews, and then see how they responded, and then they'd go out to the Gentiles. And I just want to say this as your first thought, is that the gritty, the gritty, I want to call them, you and I, Paul and Barnabas, they're gritty. The, Paul, Barnabas, I call this the PB and J and the godly grit. PB and J and godly grit. Paul and Barnabas were gritty, and the gritty know this, that success brings opposition. They're going to they're going to encounter incredible opposition here in, in this first missionary journey, and we're going to see them over and over again. They keep going. They keep going. They don't shrink back. They don't give up. Look at verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided. You see that? There was, there was people that were believing. People who were part sided with the Jews, part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. And they were preaching the gospel there. Now, you can read all that and go, okay, well, they fled. But, but pay attention to verse 2. Because uh, it says the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds. They poisoned their minds against the brethren. And then, uh, let me, I'll just read verse 3 to you. It says, therefore they stayed there a long time. So, I just love this. 
They had opposition, division. Uh, they poisoned their minds. The, the unbelieving Jews poisoned their minds towards what Paul and Barnabas and the disciples were sharing, the gospel. They, they poisoned them, and, and there was contentiousness rising up. And it says, and therefore, it doesn't say, and they fled. It says, and they stayed there a long time. Ah, ah grit. You see the grit coming out. And, and this is, is so encouraging to me. They, they, they stuck it out they, despite the opposition. Why? Because they knew God wanted them there for a season. They didn't know how long yet, but they stayed. They stayed there a long time. They, they didn't, when the first sign of opposition came, they went, God, do you still want us here? Is this okay? And they did it, and they kept going. They kept proclaiming the good news. They kept preaching the good news of Jesus. And so I, I just, I think what we can learn from this is that the gritty know when to stay and when to go. The gritty know when to stay and when to go. This is, a, this is important because sometimes at the first sign of discouragement or opposition or resistance, you shrink back and you, you just dive away. You go out of the picture. And listen, we need God to help us with the resilience, with the tenacity to go, to ask God, God, what's your time? And we need your wisdom. And I, and I gave you James 1.5. It's one of my favorite verses. I pray it multiple times a day, honestly. If anybody lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. This is a brilliant verse. Memorize it, know it, get it in your heart. Basically, if you need wisdom, and see, listen, many of us have wisdom because we've lived a long time, so we've learned some things. I'm not just talking about earthly experience and wisdom. I'm talking about godly wisdom, the right thing at the right time in the situation in which you're in. That's what Paul and Barnabas needed. They needed God's wisdom. God, do you want us to stay here in, in, in the city, or do you want us to leave? Do you want us to stay here? Are you done with the work you want to do here? Have we planted enough seeds? Have we watered enough? Are you ready for us to move on? And he hadn't. He wasn't yet. But there was a point where you see it in, that, in verses uh, 2 to 7. They obviously left at one point. They began to go. So, but, but it was the timing. It's all about timing, and they needed God's wisdom. And so lean in to God's wisdom. Ask him. He'll give it to you generously. That's what it means to be a spirit-led believer. Holy Spirit, show us. God, show us by your spirit what you want us to do next. When do we go? When do we stay? Verses 8 to 10. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had, who had never walked. So now, remember, they, they just left uh, Iconium, and now they're in, they go to Lystra and Derby. So this is, this is this area of uh, Galatia. And, and when you read the book of uh, the letter to the Galatian churches, that Galatia is a region. It's not just one city. And so this is this, all these cities are in this region called Galatia. So let's go back and read it again. In Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him pay attention, listen to, listen to this, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. Uh, your third thought here from this is that the gritty look for and engage faith moments. Now, Paul, it says here that uh, the man, the crippled man who was crippled from birth from his mother's womb, he heard Paul speaking. So he heard Paul sharing the gospel, the good news. And where was he doing this? Well, uh, I, there's a pattern that you'll see with Paul and Barnabas is that when they go to a city and the city has a synagogue, they go there first. But a synagogue couldn't be established. In order to establish a synagogue, you had to have 10 Jewish believing males. And so they don't go to the synagogue. It, it says they don't. It, as a matter of fact, so what would they have done? Well, they probably went to the marketplace, which would have been the social hub of the city where the entertainers and philosophers would hang out. And it was, it was, the, it was the place to be. They would have gone there and shared the good news. And this is where they encounter this, this man who was crippled from birth. And it says that, I like what verse 9 says. It says they heard Paul speaking. He heard Paul speaking. And Paul, observing him intently. So Paul noticed something about this man. He noticed that that there was a faith rising up in him. He had heard the gospel, and this faith rises up in him. He sees it as he looks at him intently, and, and then he says, he calls out to him, and he says, stand up straight on your feet. I mean, this is a guy with has never walked, has never, his feet are atrophied, his muscles aren't there, his, the ligaments, all these things are just, you know, they hadn't been used. So there was no way, there was, there was a creative miracle to happen, not only instant uh, strength and muscle tone enough to stand up, Boom, he leaps up and starts walking. 
awesome, right in the marketplace, right in the center of town. Uh, you see a gift of faith uh, rise up in this, this man. Paul sees it and notices it, and the gift, one of those gifts of healings was, was spor- poured out that we hear about in 1 Corinthians 12, right here, and this man gets healed. Listen, spirit-led believers like you and I, you might go, well, I'm not Paul. I'm not Barnabas. Listen, they had the same spirit. We have the same spirit that they have, the same Holy Spirit. And it's the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus, he did everything he did on this planet, right? He was fully God, fully man, but he laid down his divine privileges. And he did and performed all the miracles and signs and wonders he did, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he did that so that you and I would have that example that, listen, we also can do those things. So the key thing is to recognize the gospel was preached first. When you and I share our testimony, when we share God's story, and then we look for faith moments, we look for, and we engage, we look for faith rising up. It's so important to engage that, to lean into that, actually to have that expectation that that's going to happen. I want to encourage you today, when you're out and about, be looking for those faith moments. Look for, as you share your testimony or your heart or story, or you see someone doing it, look for faith arising in people and and ask God, what do you want me to do here? Verse 11, "Now now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Uh, and Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. So what we see here is a really weird thing. And I, and I just, I, we know that Paul and Barnabas were not expecting this. They go into this city, and, and I don't think they'd done the background check on the city. But historically, what had happened in this city is that they, there was a legend there that, that Zeus and Hermes had, come, had visit, come down in bodily form and visited the city of Lystra. And, and when they did, they were looking for lodging, looking for hospitality. And nobody would give it to them except for this one elderly couple. This one elderly couple welcomes them in. They wipe out the whole city. This is the myth. This is the legend. They wipe out the whole rest of the city completely. Everybody else dies except for this one couple. Anyway, then they have these monuments to them and this couple in the city. And so... What's happening here is that they just saw a miracle happen with this crippled man, and Paul, you know, prays for him, and boom, he boom. And so they're like, oh, it's Zeus and Hermes. Obviously, this is, they, this, remember, this is a city with no Jewish synagogue. There, was no, uh, there wasn't enough believers in the city at that point to even have that. So that, there wasn't even 10 Jewish believers in the city. So, so their context is Greek gods. And, and they're like, we're scared. We don't want this to happen again. We're not, we're not getting wiped out again, so we're going to like worship these guys. So they start to, and they're speaking in their Lyconian language, of which Paul and Barnabas didn't understand, so they didn't quite catch, catch a clue early on what was happening. But all of a sudden, we find they go, oh my gosh, they're, <laughs> they're, they're trying to worship us. What's going on? Look at verse 14. When, and when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore, it says they tore their clothes and ran in among the people, the multitude rather, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? Why are you doing these things? We're also men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed the nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, verse 17, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven in fruitful seasons, filling our hearts and food with gla- food and gladness. And with these things, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. They were convinced these guys were gods. They were, they were <laughs> and, and they're like, it says that they, they tore their clothes. And, and why did they do that? I think they, part, of, part of it was a common tradition amongst Jewish people that if someone is, if there's blasphemy taking place, you rip your clothes. It was a common reaction. Uh, Or also, I think they did it because they're like, listen, we're just, can you see we're just men? We're just humans, like flesh and blood. Don't, don't worship us. This is not about us. This is about the God who loves you. This is about Jesus and the gospel and the good news. He comes to save and rescue you. But man, they're confused. Now, uh, something, something I, I want to draw from this little chunk is, is the next thought, is that the gritty watch for worship drift. Is that the gritty believers who have perseverance and endurance and grit, they, even when we're out doing the mission, we have to watch for worship drift. I like what Dr. Thomas Const, Const, uh, 
how do you say his name, Const- Constable says, he says, if Satan cannot derail Christian witness with persecution, he will try praise. Hmm. Too much persecution has destroyed many preachers, and too much praise has ruined many others. Listen, if persecution wouldn't stop them, what is he going for? What's the enemy going for? Well, maybe I'll try to, uh, you know, go after their pride a little bit and say, yeah, maybe we are kind of amazing. Maybe, maybe Paul and Barnabas will go, yeah, you know, that's true. I mean, we are incredible. Sometimes, sometimes people miss the source of the miracle, and they just go to the, the vehicle in which it came, which was Paul and Barnabas. Obviously, this is about praising God, but Man, they're not catching the clue that the people in, in the city there, they're, they're just trying to worship Paul. And they, they thought they were Zeus and Hermes. I mean, understandable, but they didn't have that context. And I like what verse 17 says. It says, he, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good. Remember, he said, basically, listen, God has given you clues. He, it, it, there's a common grace that's actually here for all of us, that God sends rain on your neighbor's yard and your yard and every, you know, there's so much good that happens in our city, God, or in our world. God's common grace is out there. There is evidence of God everywhere. And, um, and saving grace is different than common grace. You can have common grace which should point you to, to, the, to the creator of the universe and then allow you to engage in his saving grace that comes through the cross. So watch for worship drift. And, and part of this too, as I want to say this, is that the gritty turn from their idols. The gritty turn from their idols. That should be your next thought uh, on on the screen. And and what do I mean by this? Well, I like what John Piper says. He says, true worship is a valuing or a treasuring of God above all things. And and I, as I read through this and I was thinking about this, I think this is such a key thing for all of us. And it's a temptation to always uh, have our worship shift from the one who deserves it completely, which is our God to other things, to lesser things. We're, we're always worshiping. It's just the, the question is, what's the object of your worship? And, and you might go, well, how, how, do I, how do I know if I'm drifting? How do I know if, if I'm worshiping an idol? Because you might go, aren't idols those little Buddhas you see and stuff like that? Well, that could be an idol, but I'm not even talking about just a physical, you know, little statue. I'm talking about things in your heart that are misdirected attention, things that you're allowing to come above God in your worship, in your, in your attention. And, and a good clue to know this is, what do you tend to return to again and again instead of going to God? When things get hard or, or just in your daily activities, what are you turning to more than God? I mean, there's a great tendency to make idols and worship celebrities and resist and exalt things and people and places and material things. As a matter of fact, you know, what do I mean by this? Because you know, in this situation we just read with Paul and Barnabas, should they have honored Paul and Barnabas? Well, I think, you know, you see your buddy that has been crippled from birth get healed. You might want to honor, I mean, value them, esteem them, honor them, yes, but do not worship them. Worship is only designed for God. So let me ask you a question. As you're sitting there listening and tuning in, what do you think some idols are that people struggle with, that humans struggle with, that you and I struggle with? What would some idols be? Like, for instance, I, I don't know, because we, you know, I can't talk to you on the screen, but, but I, I, I'm thinking about things like, what about people? People can become idols. Relationships could be an addiction issue. Could, food can become an idol. Our hobbies can become idols. Our political party can become an idol. Material things, money, spending, alcohol, drugs, sex, gossip. I mean, the list is long really long, and, and, and I think those are like the low-hanging fruit things to think about that could be idols. But what if, have you ever thought about this? What if one of your idols, or one of my idols, would be comfort? <laughs> yeah, comfort. What about, what, about, what about success? Can success be an idol? Can, can admiration and the applause of others be an idol? What about control? Can control become something that goes above God, that, that you place above God, and actually you're more concerned about having control than you are about worshiping God. Because remember, it's, it's what's in first place, basically. How about, you know, for me as a pastor, sometimes ministry can become an idol. You might go, seriously, Kevin? Like, yeah, I, I mean, doing the work of God can sometimes take a bigger place than God himself. And, and I don't, I don't typically do that intentionally, but what I find is that my, my focus and my attention and my dependence on God can drift to being so involved in needs and caring for people and taking care of people and 
and, and doing the work of ministry that I miss the worship of the very one who deserves first place. I think the one that we've seen, I've sure seen in a lot in the last year has been just rights, the idol of rights. Like, well, my rights are what matter the most. And <sighs> I'm not saying they're not important, but they definitely shouldn't be in first place. Now, Paul and Barnabas, I, I think, are trying to say to those people in, in, in Leicester, they're trying to say, wait, 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 wait. We're, we're just messengers, right? We're just the messengers. The message is about the God who saves and loves. And, and he, really, he says in verse 15 here, it says in verse 15, in part, the middle part of verse 15, that you should turn from these useless things to the living God. And I, and I wrote that on the screen for you. Turn, what's the answer? Turn from the useless things and turn to the living God. Really, it's repent and believe. He, he's saying to the, they're saying to the people of Leicester, listen, don't worship us. Turn from those useless things. Don't worry about Zeus and Hermes. Don't, don't worry about these other things. And believe in the living God. All right, how about 19 to 20? Let's go there. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, okay, now I just, I just want you to get this. They, they had been, they'd gone through multiple cities here, and then there, now, that, now this new group, a group, they were in Antioch, uh, uh, <laughs> a Pisidia, and they, a group from there, which is about 100 plus miles away, and Iconium, cities that they had gotten, you know, had left, but stirred up some, had some great fruit, but also stirred up some of those unbelieving people. They make the trek. This is like going from, from Lewiston to Spokane on foot to come over to Lystra and to basically really, they're, they're coming to persecute Paul and Barnabas. And, and it says they come over to Iconium, uh, the, the Antioch crew and the Iconium crew come, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. In verse 20, however, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went to the city, and the next day he departed from Barnabas to Derbe. Now, I, I, I was thinking about this. I mean, for one, there was a really intentional persecution that happened, right? If you've got to travel 100 miles to persecute somebody by foot, you, you're pretty serious. You've you got 100 miles to think and get your anger really worked up. So when they get there, they got stones in hand. They are ready to kill Paul. They're ready to take him out. And listen, I'm not an expert on, on stoning, but obviously it was an effective form of execution. They used it a lot. And they didn't just throw pebbles at these guys. They didn't, <laughs> this, they didn't throw pebbles at Paul. These were large rocks made to, to really not just hurt and maim, but to kill. And they did it, and they come, and they throw these rocks. But what's amazing is, is that he doesn't die. Uh, I mean, some scholars think, well, maybe he rose from the dead, but it doesn't tell us that. As a matter of fact, Luke, who who penned this, inspired by God, he, he doesn't give us that kind of hyperbole. He, he doesn't exaggerate here. He gives us the facts. And in verse 20, um, you know, or, or verse uh, 20, yeah, they, they, they stoned, 19, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, thought he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, we're, we're assuming that they prayed. It doesn't tell us they prayed, but I'm thinking, I don't think they were just looking down at Paul going, oh man, he looks bad. I think they prayed. <laughs> this is my, that's my opinion. And then it says, as they gathered around him, he rose up. He rose up. I mean, I, I'm just thinking, he's got to be really bleeding, bruised, broken. I mean, we don't know, but a miracle happens. He didn't die. Or if he did die, he rose again in that moment. He rose up, it says, the scripture says. And, 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 and I would expect it to say, he rose up and fled to the next city. It doesn't say that. Look what it says in verse 20 again. It says, he rose up and went into the city. He went into the city. He, they dragged him outside of the city. He stands back up after they, after they had a little prayer meeting there. And he walks back into the city. And I think he walks through town and goes, he, we don't know because it doesn't tell us. But I'm just thinking, he went back in the city intentionally to go, listen, I'm on a God mission when it's my time to actually leave and God tells me to go from the city, I will. But you can't kill me. You can't stop the mission of God. Oh, love it. And, 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 and how do I know it was he hurt? I mean, because Galatians 6, this is not on the screen, but Galatians six seventeen says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. And there's other places that imply that he was, he had, you know, wounds. He had scars. He just like Jesus had scars, Paul had scars. So he, this hurt, this wasn't, but he walks back in the city, it says. And uh, doesn't say the guys carried him. No, he walks back in. Incredible. Goes back in the city and eventually 
he goes uh, to Derby and, uh, and, and goes to the next place. But I, I just, I guess I just love the fact that he is that gritty. <laughs> He's that gritty. He's so got his position, God's in the first place position in his life. He, he's like, he and, he and Barnabas are like, okay, listen, we are on a mission from God and nothing will stop it. We will only go where God tells us to go and no one can stop us. When God tells go, we go. And then the, and the last thought I have here is that the gritty multiply disciples. The gritty multiply disciples, verse 21, and when they had preached the gospel to the city and made many disciples and made many disciples and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch And when they did that, they strengthened the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Verse 22, leave that on the screen if you would. It says, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Now that's, again, that's not a verse you see a lot and people don't quote that a lot. But he's saying, listen, listen, we, this journey on this planet with the Jesus mission as the greatest mission ever, there will be hardship, there will be trials. James 1 talks about the same thing, multiple places. There will be suffering, there will be difficulty. But listen, it's part of the package, but it's worth it. It's worth the difficulty, the challenge. It's the greatest. We have the cure for the greatest disease ever called sin, ever given, and we have the cure. And you and I each, even at a minimum, we have the ability to see Hundreds, if not thousands of people saved because of your sharing of the good news. When you share the good news, God multiplies it and he changes human hearts. So, multiply disciples. It's a big deal. And I, and I think what we need to notice is that they get to the end of the missionary journey. They get to the farthest point, And then it says they returned. They go back. They don't take another route home. They turn right back around and go. Because they, they weren't just making disciples, they were planting churches. So they established churches. They set in elders, appointed elders, who couldn't have been very uh, old in their faith. So, so, you know, it wasn't ideal, but they, they were just, who are the older ones here? Who are the more mature ones? God, show us who you want. They set elders in place. They were planting hubs of churches where, where people could be strengthened and discipled in the ways of the Lord. So they return back. They go back on that route, back to each of those cities, places they were kicked out of, places that were hostile, places where they were left for dead. <laughs> and they strengthen the churches as they return. And they go back and eventually get back home. And let's read the rest of that. Verse 24, it says, And after they had passed through uh, Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, Great names. Now, these are regions, okay? Now, when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from there sailed to Antioch. So they, they got back to the coast at line, and then they, they don't go to Cyprus. They, go, they, they just take the sea back to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they'd completed. So they get back home. They get back to Antioch, the place they'd been sent out from, and they give the report. They're like, God sent some amazing things. Verse 27, and when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he'd opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. That's the whole chapter in, in a pretty short, quick, quick run. But it, they gave a great report. They, they had quite the stories of, you know, persecution, uh, uh, you know, healings, uh, being stoned and yet not killed, Paul could share. And it was just massive success but it came at a big cost. It came at a really big cost. And Paul and Barnabas were not just followers of Jesus, but they were followers of Jesus with incredible grit, incredible perseverance. And you guys, as you're tuning in, I just want you to know God will give you that. He's not asking you to muster that up in your own strength. He's saying, if you worship me and focus on me and ask me, in your weakness, I will be strong. If you admit you need me, admit you're weak, I will give you the strength, the grit, the perseverance, the endurance, the resolve, the resilience, everything you need. Where you're fearful, I will give you faith if you would ask me and admit it. And when you, you ask me, fill me with your spirit, God. And, and when you're filled with the spirit, not only will you have joy, and, and, but you'll have the power to accomplish the mission of which I've sent you on. 
And, and it's just powerful. And, and you know, I, I don't have these on the screen, but Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, I want to remind you of some things you probably already know. But here it is. Jesus says this. What's the greatest commandment? One of the Pharisees asked him, well, what's the greatest commandment? Sum up the law and the prophet. What's the greatest? He goes, you can sum up the law and prophets. Here's the greatest thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Heart, soul, and mind. In other words, with everything in you, internal, external, all of it, heart, soul, mind, strength, all of it. Love God first. <sighs> Worship him above all else. And then Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, as right before he's about to depart and go to be with the Father, he's like, listen, all authority has been given to me, Jesus says. And I send you, I send you with, with divine authority from heaven. I grant this to you, I give this to you. Go, therefore go. I've got the authority, I've got the power. I'm gonna give you the spirit. He's gonna come and empower you. And we see that in Acts. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And, sh- and, and remember this, I'm going to be with you always till the end of the age. Pastor Brad said it last week. He said, it's the great go mission. It's the great go mission. We go and we make disciples. It's beautiful. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's the thing worth living for, you guys. You might go, why am I on this planet? You're on this planet to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, with everything, and to take the good news out and make disciples. You might go, what do I do for a living? Well, that, that's, that's purpose. And, and how that works out in what sphere of influence God's given you, well, it's going to look different than me. For me, it's in this season of my life, it's pastoring. But it could be, it's not what I'm doing for, uh, for a job. It, it's, it's, it's my purpose in life is to help take the gospel to those who don't yet know it. That purpose resonates in me. That gets me, gets me up in the morning. It, 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 it's the thing. And, and it requires grit. It requires a perseverance because life gets hard and things come at us and opposition happens and sometimes the enemy is throwing stones. My question to you, I've got a couple on the screen. Here's three questions for you to reflect on. First thought is, how are you making disciples? How are you making disciples? Just leave these up. And what will it take, this is an interesting question, what will it take for you to back down from doing God's will? We see Paul and Barnabas, they had a lot of opposition, a lot. They didn't back down. It's actually interesting in chapter 13, John Mark, we don't know a whole lot about John Mark, but he bails on the mission. He gets to the continent or to the, the area of Turkey, that modern day Turkey, after he gets off of Cyprus and he turns around and goes back home. We don't know why. But he backed out. But Paul and Barnabas didn't. They kept going. What's it, what will it take for you to back down? You might ask that. God, where's my weak spot? Where, where, am, I, where am I vulnerable? And the third, the third question is, what idols are you entertaining? Wow. Yeah, what idols? Because those idols can become the very thing that gets you off track, gets you distracted. As amazing as this story is about Paul and Barnabas, as incredible as these guys are, the story really isn't about Paul and Barnabas. It's ultimately about Jesus, who is the one with the greatest grit, right? <laughs> that he, he never backed down. He is the grittiest. He is the one with the most endurance and the most uh, perseverance. And even when he knew he was going to carry the weight of the sins of the, of the whole world upon his shoulders, He went to the cross. He died. He paid the penalty for shame and guilt and pain and sin that you and I deserved. He took the sting of death upon himself for you and I. So why why did he do that? So we could be forgiven, saved, transformed, free, free in Christ to be all God's made us to be. Let me pray with you today. I I want you to think about this message, and I'm going to ask God to help you apply it. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity today to look at Acts 14. God, I thank you for what you did in Paul and Barnabas. I thank you for their example of grit. I thank you for what we can learn that, God, that that we don't have to back down, that when you call us on mission, Lord, you'll give us the, the endurance, the strength, the grit to accomplish it, God. And, and But, Lord, we can be tempted with worshiping other things or even ourself or and, and God, get distracted, and, and the enemy's always trying to throw those at us, so show us if there's idols in our life, things we need to turn away from and lay down and repent of. God, we don't want anything above you. 
God, and help us to remember why we're doing this. This is all about you and about the thousands of people, even in our own community, our own cities, wherever we live, that don't yet know you. We have the answer. We have the cure for the disease of death and the disease of separation from you. And, and Lord, we, you asked us to take out the cure and let people know about it, to give it away. Help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you, didn't, if, you, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him and you want to know him and you want to say, Kevin, I, I want to receive Christ, just agree with this prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Lord, I receive you today. I receive this grace gift you offer today. Thank you for paying the price for me. I want to be your child from this day forward, your, your, your disciple, your follower. I want to learn all about you in this journey. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision, text into us, RCC Life to 97000. We'll get you a series of videos over the next week and help you, it'll, steps to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Thanks for tuning in today. Have an awesome rest of your day. We love you.